I am uh, Alexander Carpentier. I'm a neurosurgeon at Paris uh, Sorbonne University of uh, Paris, and i um, working mostly on brain tumors and uh, performing surgery on brain tumors. Um, one of the main problems with brain tumors is when you, have, uh, when you perform the surgery and uh, afterwards they need to have a chemotherapy session and the chemotherapy sessions are efficient but not sufficiently enough so that the patient is dying about 18 months after his uh, first diagnosis. And one of the main reasons of this is the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is uh, the fact that the medication that gets into the blood don't get into uh, the brain because uh, vessels are uh, not accepting uh, those medication inside the brain. This is what we call the blood-brain barrier. Though this is a big issue for brain tumor treatment, but also for Alzheimer's disease, where you know that um, many medication do exist, but don't get into the brain. Here, for example, the chemotherapy, you have the nitrosoyure that gets into the brain not so badly, and the timozolomide also. So this is why those two drugs are used. But all the other drugs that we know don't get into the brain, especially the new drugs with immunotherapy. New drugs are larger drugs so that they don't get into the brain sufficiently enough to be efficient. The blood-brain barrier is uh, both a physical barrier, because there is tight junction between the cells, and there is also a chemical barrier, metabolic barrier, which is uh, when the drug um, tries to get in, there is some efflux pump that takes it back to the bloodstream. When you have brain pathologies, those efflux pump are even higher represented so that the tumor, so that the medication don't get into the brain correctly. So um, different researchers uh, have tried since uh, many years to increase the drug delivery in the brain, but it was not that successful. High-dose chemotherapy was tried, but evidently very toxic. Uh, Atra arterial direct carotid injection of the drugs also have been tried, but it's, you can't do it every time. It's very traumatic. Osmotic agents were used also, but uh, there is some uh, systemic complications. And um, in the last 10 years, we tried uh, as, uh, in our surgery to put some uh, wafer of drug, long-term delivery drug inside the surgical field, but mostly the drugs at 95% don't go in the brain, but goes in the CSF, so it's not, definitely not efficient. And convection enhanced delivery, which is a catheter that is placed inside the tumor or inside the brain to deliver drug. It do works, but the problem is you have a catheter that goes out from the skin and you can keep it for three days, but no more. Um, so the key point is in uh, 2001 when uh, Aininen um, showed that we can disrupt the blood-brain barrier temporarily by using uh, ultrasound associated with microbubbles. Microbubbles are commonly used uh, in diagnostic uh, echography because it increases the signal uh, noise ratio. But if you put it, if you have a, a specific frequency of ultrasound, you can have those microbubbles vibrate, meaning that they can squeeze here and they can, they can get bigger between uh, considering the, the wave and this increase and uh, vibration of the bubbles are inducing a viscoelastic stress on the vessels and that's why the blood brain barrier gets open and we have also a down regulation of the efflux pump that I was talking to you about so not only it's a mechanical, but also there is a biological consequences. So that the blood brain barrier stays open for six hours. Ultrasound emission is only for two to four minutes, but the blood brain barrier stays open for eight hours. Perfect for a chemotherapy session. Um, there is mostly two techniques to perform this blood brain barrier. Either you have ultrasound 
given from the outside of the brain. Um, either you implant ultrasound transducer inside the skull uh, during a search during zoo surgery that has to be performed uh, for the tumor resection for, for the initial tumor resection. Um, the advantage of external ultrasounds is that you don't implant anything, but it takes time. It takes MR. You have to shape the patient. You have to do it under MRI to check the uh, focalization. <coughs> Um, the advantage of putting transducer inside the skull, not inside the brain, inside the skull, is that you avoid all the bone so that you know exactly what uh, emission you are uh, giving to the brain. And you don't, so that you don't need to do AMR monitoring in the same time. The inconvenient is, yes, yeah, you have to implant the device. But since those patients are operated, they, anyway, it, you take the advantage of the operation to place some transducers inside the thickness of the skull. Um, here you have, in the external system, you have a focalized uh, action. In, uh, when you implant some transducer, you can have a more diffuse action. So it's very complementary techniques. One is mostly concerning deep-seated uh, disease, whereas the uh, implanted transducer are addressing some diffuse and superficial pathologies. So very complementary. Here is a, a, typically a, a case of transducer that we developed uh, uh, emitting ultrasound for a pretty, pretty large uh, lesion. So for example you see here Here the transducer has been put and uh, you see on rabbits that the Evans blue is getting into the brain. Here on MRI you see gadolinium enhancement inside the brain showing that the blood-brain barrier is open. Um, what's, what is actually really happening uh, in terms of microscopy? This is electronic microscopy images and you see that there is some um, envisionation, indentation of the endothelium, endothelial cells so that you have vesicle and vacuole that gets into and cross and goes into the brain this way. Afterwards we did some uh, toxicity because it's feasible but uh, is it uh, toxic? And uh, so we did uh, dogs to show that it was uh, not non-toxic. And we did also some primates before getting to humans and we did uh, EG uh, electroencephalography to be sure that it was not epileptogenic. We did uh, FDG PET, so metabolic analysis images, and uh, all this after each, before and after each session. Um, and those primate received the implanted device and seven repetitive sonication, one every 15 days. And at the end, we did the uh, histology. EG was perfect, so no epilepsy. Evoke potential is measuring the efficacy of the neuron, the functionality of the neurons, and it is not um, affected at all. Um, metabolic analysis on PET studies was normal, and uh, neurological exam of the, of the primates, of the three primates were totally normal. Histology, uh, the only sign we, see, we saw on histology is an extravasation of few red blood cells inside the brain, which is definitely not a trouble. Uh, doing surgery, you have many cells that get into the brain, so it's very, it's very low and perfectly tolerable. Uh, here is on a primate, a seven repetition uh, sonication, showing that even if you do it one every 15 days, you, not, you don't have any um, uh, slowing of efficacy. So you still have the same efficacy of the... So there is no acquired resistance, which is very important. For example, you know that many drugs are in development to try to cross the blood brain barrier since 20 years. But actually, sometimes it can get the first time, but the second times get half, and afterwards it doesn't get any more, because the brain understood it and is blocking the uh, conduction of this drug. So it was important to see that this mechanical opening of the blood-brain barrier was not 
um, affected by several syndications. So it's, there is no acquired resistance. Many people um, published on safety uh, for this technique, so we have all about the same um, conclusion about the total safety of the process if you respect a certain amount of pressure, actually. If you increase the pressure, you could have some bleeding. If you don't have any, enough acoustic pressure, you're not opening the blood brain barrier. So there is a tiny um, window of pressure that you are able to use. And this is why it is very important to know exactly what pressure you are delivering. Um, we did some analysis of chemotherapy delivery and you saw that there is an increase of the delivery of the brain. The chemo is injected at intravenously, peripherally, but like this, here we saw that there is for carboplatin, temozolomide and erinotecan, this is three drugs we choose, um, there is a clear augmentation of the drug inside the brain thanks to the um, ultrasound happening. And uh, this is the acoustic field. You have uh, about five times more um, concentration of the drug. And the more you go away from the acoustic field, the less drug uptake you have, of course. But uh, globally, uh, the increase is concerning 42 centimeter uh, cubic, which is uh, pretty huge. Many articles also showed that there is after blood-brain bioopening by ultrasound, there is an uptake of the chemotherapy or the different drug. It could be um, antibodies, it could be, uh, this is all chemotherapy here, but there is also antibodies we can see later. Um, on mice model, tumor mice model, when you do the ultrasound, you have a prolonged survival of the, of the tumor. And... Um, this is the um, brain under plasma uh, ratio, and you see that thanks to ultrasound, there is a clear uptake of the carboplatin. This is a new mice with human glioblastoma. This, was, this previous slide was with uh, tumor model on, on rats, but here it's um, uh, human tumor models, and we still find a good uh, efficacy because this is a bioluminescence so the more uh, light you have meaning that you have the more tumor and here this is a rope with the uh, ultrasound plus carboplatin ultrasound alone no no way no no effect just like the other drugs increased survival of rats and tumor model was confirmed also uh, with uh, different uh, teams all around the world so we have uh, now, after all those preclinical studies, safety, repeatability. Uh, it's a rapid process because it's, uh, you don't need to have the MR, so it doesn't change the, the, the flow of the patient. Uh, it's efficient, it's re re reversible, uh, meaning that the blood brain barrier is closed at eight hours after. And um, well, the only trouble is that uh, if, if it it is sometimes concert, but I don't think it is at all. Uh, it requires an implantation in the way I do it. Um, so we, we could go to humans. So we perform uh, humans after different uh, key standard compliance, security process, and whatsoever. This huge work, which is even more longer than the preclinical research, actually. And the goal was to treat... Um, um, glioblastoma patient with carboplatin and um, to have a progression intensity of ultrasound because it's a safety, it was a safety study. So when the patient was, uh, was uh, under surgery, this is a typical case where we, we did the tumor debulking and uh, we are ready to close the skin but instead of closing the skin, we put some transducer inside the uh, skull uh, burr holes. Um, but if the patient were not eligible for a tumor resection, we can do some. We did some uh, local anesthesia, uh, 15 minute surgical procedure to put the device in. And when all this is done, you wait for a week. Uh, the patient goes back home and he comes back for the chemotherapy session. 
And when he comes for the chemotherapy session, what do we do? We connect the device transdermally because it's MR compatible, so there is no battery in it. So we, by a transdermal needle, we connect, we bring the power to the uh, transducer. We emit ultrasound for four minutes with micro bubble IV injection. And uh, once we perform the two minutes ultrasound emission, you unplug the device. And afterwards, since it is a safety study, we went to MR to check the um, to check uh, the safety. And afterwards, the patient goes for carboplatin uh, injection. Um, right after the blood-brain barrier opening, we are doing MRI to check the safety, but also to see if the blood-brain barrier opening is efficient. And here, this is the pre-treatment, and this is the post-treatment. You see that there is some white dots in here meaning that the gadolinium, which, is, which appears white on T1 sequences, uh, gets into the brain rather than here, he was not into the brain. And this is a difference, uh, differential between the two images is here, showing that there is a contrast enhancement, uh, proving that the blood brain bio is open. Here also you see this is normal, and this is with blood brain bio opening, you see white dots here uh, showing the blood brain by opening. Here another case, this is pre-treatment and this is post-treatment, you clearly see the blood brain by opening. And this is for cure one, cure two, cure three, so even on humans there is no uh, acquired resistance to repeated blood brain by um, Some patients um, had 10 sessions so we are concerned about the sequence, about microbleeding of uh, accumulation toxicity by accumulation of sonication. It appears clearly on several patients that um, this that there is no trouble, no inflammation, no bleeding over time. This is at the very beginning of the treatment of the patient, and this is after ten blood brain by opening session, ten months after. Uh, this is all the cases we performed. Um, we have some, of course, non-related adverse event, but we have also some related adverse event, meaning that it could be related with the, with the uh, ultrasound emission. And mostly, uh, one patient has a facial palsy for uh, two hours only, and uh, one has had a dexterity deficit for 48 hours. And uh, one had a partial sensitive epileptic seizure that was uh, limited to the left face, meaning it was not a generalized seizure. So it was totally acceptable so that we didn't even reach the dose limiting toxicity of the trial, which is very good. Here an example of the, this patient uh, in May uh, 2016, a large tumor that was not resectable because it was in the motor strip. And here you see that after several sonication, the tumor is taking less contrast, meaning that she's less active. Um, uh, here is the same case where you see that the, at the very beginning of the treatment, you see the tumor here, and you see all here, which is in white edema, which is the inflammatory reaction due to the presence of the tumor. And after sonication time, you see that the edema is decreasing meaning that for this patient we had an efficacy on the tumor and on the edema. Uh, so it could be only due to carboplatin, but could mostly also do, be due to, thanks to the ultrasound, that increased the carboplatin. This is another patient, which is, this is a flare inflammatory signal before treatments, and this is after seven treatments. You see that the flare is decreasing, the white is getting normal, is, dispar is disappearing. Uh, so this is a very, very good results. Um, what we saw on the preliminary data, it's a little heavy slide, but mostly you can see that um, if we don't open the blood by Marianne, we have uh, this m number of months of survival. If we do open the blood barrier, we have this amount of survival in this population. And this population is, was, it was an increasing pressure of ultrasound. So the first 10 patients were not uh, uh, 
highly open. The blood by Mario was not highly open. So um, this is a very uh, good, uh, very good result. Very good result because you see for this disease, it die in six months normally. Uh, if you try to be a little tricky, change the drug and so ever, it could reach seven. Uh, the Novocure system that gets into the market recently gives 6.6 .6 months. Um, if you put Avastin, you have uh, somehow nine months of survival, um, which is a very last study, so there is a progression of survival over time, but with Sonocloud, which is at third, first, second, or third recurrence, which whereas let me, let me, um, the Avastin was at first recurrence and Novocure was for first recurrence and second also, but we should have done, we should have had those months because uh, it's first, second, and third recurrence patients, and we had the great results. So it's a small series, so there is possible bias, but so we were very happy with this. And so um, in this whole study, we did um, many sonications. About m now it's more than 85 uh, sonication on patient blood brain by opening session. We had uh, we have now the optimal uh, parameters we know, and we have a total safety. Um, we know that now that nurse can do it. It's very simple to perform, and we have strong hits for uh, efficacy. Thank you very much.